Hi, I'm Betty. I'm taking Lisa's um, five-week um, associate product management um, class, and I'm so excited to learn more about product management. I'm currently a program manager mm -hmm. at my company at a startup, um, but um, I want to pivot to product management, so that's why I'm so excited to learn from you and um, hear any quick tips on, on how to, on any skill sets for, for that pivot. Hi, Betty. Welcome. Hi, my name is Ricky. First of all, thank you so much, Lisa, for, for doing this. It's such a great um, great thing you're doing. I know, especially with your full-time job and everything. Um, my name is Ricky, and I used to be an internal PM with uh, NASA, and I wanted to learn more about uh, business-to-consumer product management. I also signed up for Lisa's five-week APM course, and I'm excited to learn more about consumer product management. Hello, Ricky. Welcome, welcome. Hey, everybody. This is Hari. I uh, worked with Sandia and a couple of uh, companies in the past, including Jennifer Networks. Uh, saw this in her LinkedIn profile and uh, just wanted to jump in. I've always been interested in product management and kind of a partner management role right now. So I'm really excited to see how we can kind of tie them together. Hey, oh, my on? God. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So great to see you here. Same here. It's good to see you as well. And uh, let me just say this is perfect timing just before the NBA finals. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so I see that it's three past five now. Uh, we are recording, so hopefully folks will slowly flow in and join us. I do see more and more people are popping on, but at this time, I'm going to kind of get started with the introductions. And just a reminder, while you're on the call, please mute yourself, just so that we don't um, kind of, I know sometimes with backgrounds, we're all working from home, right? So there's a kind of sounds and your family and everyone's running around. So definitely, if you don't mind, please mute yourself. And obviously, if you have a question, so by the time we get to the Q&A, feel free to unmute. And yeah, super excited today to welcome Cynthia Castellino with us. As I had mentioned in her bio, as well in the event description, she is a senior product manager at Juniper Networks. And today we'll get to hear her story as well as her journey. And she has prepared a great talk for us. Mm. Quick intro, part of this is a series where I'm effectively running a five-week aspiring product manager program with a group, uh, my first cohort of about 50 APMs. I'm really excited. And for me, a, a little bit quick intro about myself. My name is Lisa Huang Noor. I'm currently a product and program leader at Planet, which is a startup based in San Francisco, and we're using space to help life on Earth. Hi everyone, once again, thank you so much Lisa for the introduction. I am Sandia Castellino, I'm a senior product manager at Juniper Networks, where we build networking and security solutions for enterprise data center, uh, um, sorry, enterprise cloud, as well as service providers. Um, and I've been at Juniper about uh, as a PM over five for five and a half years now, but uh, my journey started about 17 years ago, where uh, I started out as a network engineer for a startup right out uh, after grad school uh, for a company called Vertela Communications. At Vertela, I used to build WAN communications uh, solutions for enterprises. And then from there, I moved to um, a service provider, a tier one ISP called Sprint Communications. And at Sprint, um, I was at Sprint about nine years, or over nine years. And I started out on their wireline side of, of the house, building uh, and testing solutions for um, MPLS VPNs as well as the internet backbone. And a few years into that, uh, there was a big industry trend uh, inflection point taking place um, where a lot of investment was going into the 4G wireless network. Um, you all know it as 4G LTE. Uh, Sprint was rolling out a nationwide network and they needed expertise there. So I moved to the wireless side, decided to learn uh, about the wireless uh, 
business as well as uh, wireless networking and uh, built, uh, tested, designed, tested, and built uh, pro products for, uh, or the backhaul solution for the Sprint's wireless uh, network. Um, I also moved uh, then to do some designing and, and solution uh, building for small cells, the small cell network. And at this point um, is where I decided to make a transition to product. I was still in engineering at Sprint and um, I actually ended up working on a product where I saw the impact of not having a product manager on the project and what happened to it. Uh, and, and so I decided to move to Juniper Networks as a product manager. And uh, people have asked in, in, you know, here and some questions here as well as many times um, outside, uh, I get this question a lot as to why product management. Uh, you will get this question as well if you're interviewing. This is what recruiters like to ask as well. What, what drove you into product management? For me, um, it, it, it was two things. It was building on my technical skills um, and adding on the business skill set. And the product management role I found was the perfect balance of both the technical as well as the business aspect. Um, it, and the second was um, I've seen firsthand what not having, uh, a, 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 what happens to projects when they don't have good product management oversight. In fact, one of the last projects that I worked on at Sprint, we, as, as an engineer, I worked on it for about a year and a half. We designed, built the product. We tested it out in the field. We rolled it out to a few sites as well. And before we went to do, uh, you know, we were ready to roll it out nationwide. And the whole program got scrapped. Uh, and the reason was because we, there was no way to recognize revenue from that product. It didn't have a solid business case behind it. And um, you know, the executives decided they didn't want to invest any more into that program than they already had. Um, and it got scrapped. I feel like a good product management perspective would have identified this at the start and there are still some product, products and some programs that you choose to do for strategic reasons, but you know all of that upfront. You know which ones, um, you know, as a product manager, it's, it's you know, part of your role to research and figure out what the, uh, you know, the, the business case and the revenue model is for that product and, or the strategic value is of that product. So that's what started my product journey and at Juniper Networks, uh, I've launched uh, two products in, on the routing portfolio, and I'm currently in the software and automation team where I'm building an intent-based SaaS product from the ground up. So that's my journey in a nutshell. Um, I put a few slides together to help guide our conversation, um, help answer some of your, the questions that I've seen beforehand. Um, as well as, you know, give you some tips and tricks for how to build your product journey. And I want to leave plenty of time in the end for questions as well. So let's, you know, we'll share a few slides and then we'll get into uh, the questions. So great person, Mark Twain once said that the secret to getting ahead is just getting started. And I firmly believe in this. If you want to do something uh, or you want to get somewhere, there are ways for you to start right now. And what do I mean by that? So um, okay, the animation didn't really work well here, but anyway, you start with the role that you're in today. Any role that you're in today, you, want, you, are, you all are working on products in some way, shape or form. All of you work on products today in some way, shape, or form. What you can do starting right now is put on the user persona. Think about the customer that's going to use that product and wear that customer's requirements like a badge around you. There's a, anything you're working on, think about how that customer would use it. If you're in engineering and you're building a feature, 
Don't just build it because somebody tells you to build it a certain way. Ask questions and try to find out who the end user is of that feature. How do they actually use that product? And uh, you may be able to then uh, build it in a way that makes it even more than what you've been asked to do. Um, other examples are uh, even if you're in uh, program management or if you're in marketing, there are ways to represent your customer no matter what you're doing today. This is, I've been asked this question before as well, um, and it, it came up here also, is that, um, you know, what is the single most thing that you think has helped you in your career as a product manager? And this is the one thing that I'll say has helped me throughout my career, not just in product management, but this is a, a, a quality that is integral to product management. You have to inculcate this now if you want to be an effective product manager in the future. There are a lot of things to learn once you take on a product management role. This is not something you want to condition yourself to once you have the role you want, you want to already be there before you start. The second thing that we product managers do, and we do this on a daily basis, is pitch the product to someone, whether it is to customers externally, whether it is to um, sales teams that are selling the product. Sometimes we have to pitch it internally to engineering and executives. We're pitching the product all the time. Practice promoting whatever you're working on. Even if you're working on a feature, you're working on a project as a program manager, you're uh, working on a, a, a marketing project, um, you're working in sales, practice constantly pitching that product, Tr bringing forth the value of it to the user. So pitch, pitch it in such a way that you do it from the user's perspective. What's the value proposition of what you're doing? This is something you will have to, again, do day in and day out as a product manager. And this is a skill that you can start practicing today. The other thing I like to think that anyone can do right now is we, most of us, if not all of us, have organizations um, that have a product team. Uh, sometimes those teams are collapsed and, and one person takes on uh, uh, multiple roles. But uh, in medium to large organizations, there typically is a product team. Ask how you can help. Build contacts within that product team and offer to help. One thing uh, that any product manager will tell you is that we always have more things on our plate than we have time to do. Uh, we're multitasking to the nth degree. And if, if someone comes up to me and offers to help, I will be more than happy uh, to, you know, have them take on some things to see, you know, to, to offload something. But what are the areas where you can try to help? Most of the products that we work on, they have competitors. And as product managers, we have to constantly stay on top of competitors, not only in terms of what they're doing now, but where they're investing in the future where the market is heading, what are the trends, and we don't often have the time to do this as much as we'd like. All of that information is available publicly. Anyone can do that research. Offer to help your product managers with doing competitive analysis. This will not only help them build better products, this will help you think like a product manager and learn about what we do in PM. So there's another question that had come up that I want to answer before I move to the next slide as well, is um, it, the question comes up often about how to transition to product management. There are several ways to do this. Uh, the easiest way I would, I would say is try to move to a product management role within your current organization. You already have the contacts, you have a network, and you have access to the hiring manager, introduce yourself, introduce yourself to the PM team as well. Shadowing them is one way to do that, like I mentioned. Make sure that they know who you are if that's who, if that's where you want to go and try to, you know, the, the next time they have a position open, they will think of you. Uh, it's, it, it, and, and you will 
you have skipped many of the steps that or the hurdles that you come across when you try to do this at another company. Another way you can think of doing this is if you are a, a business that has vendors, you are already the user of someone's product. You are the user of another company's product. Reach out to them, build contacts out there. They always want to hear a customer's perspective. So think about what it is they're offering and how you can help them build better products. And through that connection, um, you can always try to apply or, or use that connection to apply for uh, a position, a PM position in that company. That's something that I did uh, at Juniper. I was, I, when I worked at Sprint, I worked with multiple vendors and I uh, really understood what the customer requirements were. And when I, you know, did my interviews at Juniper, when I, even once I started working at Juniper, I always took that, that uh, perspective with me and that helped me build better products as well. This is what they were looking for as well, um, you know, to, to get that customer perspective into their product. Another way um, you can do it, and um, some folks have said that it's very hard to get interviews for product management roles if you don't have a, the title on your resume. Uh, the other way thing you can do, it, it takes a little longer, is to move into a product adjacent role first. Uh, product managers, uh, they work very closely with product marketing folks. They work very closely with program managers, um, engineering, of course. Move to a product adjacent role where you can then introduce yourself and work with the product team on a regular basis and move into product that way. And of course, there are uh, the last way is uh, if you're new to product management, there are some bigger companies that offer associate PM roles that are designed for uh, folks who are trying to break into product. So there's always that route as well. Many of you, especially uh, those who've taken uh, Lisa's course and others have heard about the PM life cycle or different, different phases for product management. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the actual phases themselves. I'll quickly take you through them. But uh, I want to talk about how you can apply these phases to your journey right now. There's a product ideation phase which starts with deciding where investment is going to go. So uh, your companies have these strategy meetings. Um, you know, if you have, uh, if you're at a small startup, sometimes this is a vision of the CEO. Sometimes this comes out of product proposals. Uh, there's an there's there's an ideation process that happens to decide where investment is going to happen for the next few years, and that's what determines what products are going to be built. Often, product managers are not part of this process. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Uh, Either way, you get you get involved in, in, in a project that, that that has been decided it needs to happen, and you get to be the PM on that. What you what you can and should do, and what PMs typically do next, is they look at the market for that product. Just because someone tells you you have to build a product, you don't just go and build a product. Right? You want to understand why are you building that product, who are you building it for, and what is the uh, revenue model for that product. Because in the end, you are responsible as a PM for the success of that product in terms of sales. So you want to make, make sure you've done all of the research around competitive analysis, around what are the what is the target addressable market uh, that you're going to go after, um, and build your revenue model or your business case around that. Um, the next phase, once you decided and once you have a good understanding of why you're building that product, is to start talking to, to the users, talking to customers, and building requirements. This is a very time-consuming process, something we take a lot, spend a lot of time on, because you need to know what to build. And for this, when you talk to customers, you want to find out what their pain points are. You can do this today as well for any of the products that you're working on. When, uh, if you get a chance to talk to customers, I mentioned shadowing product managers. You can ask them if, if they'd be willing to let you sit in on their meetings with customers or sit in on their meetings with the sales teams to try to understand what are 
what are customers asking for, what are their pain points that you're going to solve. And based on that, you build your requirements. Uh, this is also the time where you have identified your market segment based on all the market data you have before. You divide your product into phases and you determine which segment and which phase you're going to go after first. And um, on the basis of that market segment and those, those uh, requirements, you build uh, uh, what we call a minimum viable product and then you know, follow on uh, features and add follow on features in subsequent phases. That's the execution phase. There's some level of prioritization that happens here as well. There's the go-to-market go phase, which is where we do things like prepare for the actual launch of the product. We price the product. We, we look at you know how, how, how to price the different pricing models that you can use. How do you price products? How do you, uh, you know, you have to get uh, customers as well as in, whether they're internal or external set up to test the product before you roll it out widely. We call that alpha and beta testing. There's also, you may have heard the term A, A and B testing, user testing. Uh, there is, you build your sales strategy. Do you want to go with direct sales or do you want to use partnerships? If you want to use partnerships, you start building those uh, early on. Uh, and then you also determine how you're going to market the product and what are your, your different, uh, you know, what levers are you going to use in terms of marketing? There's the next phase, which is a launch where you sell and you, uh, this is where you actually sell your product. You, you start tracking the metrics for the product and, and under, understand how it's doing. This gives you information on whether you need to pivot for your other phases, you, whether you need to make changes, you need to closely track all the metrics for that product that you launched. Um, and uh, this is also where you do the bulk of your prioritization. You have to prioritize new features that are coming in. Remember, you still have phases that you have to complete. But once you launch a product, there are always going to be issues and bugs and all of that. You have to fix those as well. So this is this is a very, very hard part of uh, product management. It's, it's an art to prioritize. Then there was also a question that came up uh, asking, how do you as a PM prioritize? And I can tell you this is also a question that comes up in interviews a lot. Hiring managers will ask you, but, but this, you know, when you do, uh, when you talk to other product managers, we all want to learn from each other as well about what's the best way to prioritize because we all get, you know, have, have uh, run into this at some point. The method I use here um, is a modified form of the RICE prioritization method. Some of you may have heard of it. If you haven't, there's, I won't go into, there's a lot of, uh, uh, material available about the RICE methodology. It, it uses four attributes, uh, reach, impact, confidence, and effort. It has some drawbacks though. It, it isn't, doesn't really work well for uh, dynamic businesses where you have to make changes uh, often, uh, or it, it, it also tends to favor low effort items. So you want to modify it according to your business needs. I add another, um, aspect to the to the prioritization score based on whether you know i have an escalation from a customer that we do not want to lose or if i have some strategic features that have no customers right now but you know there are market trends that determine that, that guide uh, the the prioritization of that and so you can i you know add a separate impact score to bring that up on the priority list so that's one way i do it uh, there's several other ways to prioritize as well but this is one way i found that uh, brings consistency across the whole product team. So if you have multiple product managers working on either the same product or different aspect uh, or different products, they will all use uh, the same way to prioritize. Uh, and then lastly, we have the end of life process, uh, which is when you sunset a product. Ricky had mentioned in the beginning that he was uh, B2C. Uh, he was interested in the B2C aspect of this. Uh, this process and there was a question that was asked before as well uh, about you know how do you how is product management different from b2b versus b2c i would say most of the differences lie in the go-to market and in the launch phases where you, the way you acquire customers is different for b2b versus b2c and the way you um, uh, you know sell and collect metrics 
is different, the way you price is different. Um, for B2B, for example, when you want to do customer acquisition, you use your sales teams. You typically have sales teams, uh, either direct sales teams or you use sales teams plus a combination of partnerships. With uh, B2C, they use uh, something, they, use, they tend to use like performance marketing where they uh, promote the product uh, in, in different arenas, different places to have users come to you to buy the product. So the, the way you acquire customers is different. And then the metrics that you measure are also different um, for B2B versus B2C. So there's just, uh, pricing is also very different uh, for all of this. So there, there's a lot of material uh, that, that's available on the differences of this as well that I'll encourage you to read. What I wanted to say about all of these phases here now in terms of your journey is how does this apply to you if you are not a PM yet, but you want to be one? There are certain, when you talk to hiring managers, when you talk to recruiters, what they're looking for is for you to show these qualities, for you to demonstrate these, uh, the, the ability to do these tasks in a, a PM role. You can do some of these tasks today. Um, a really great example of how to do that is by taking on small projects of your own on the site. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. I was in uh, my mom's, I have a mom's Facebook, Facebook group and um, somebody on there had actually posted recently about, uh, a mom on there had posted recently about her parents who own a farm and they, you know, with farmers markets being, you know, they had gotten hit by COVID and stuff. They were looking at alternate ways to sell their product, uh, you know, their vegetables and fruits. And um, she was polling the whole, uh, the whole group to find out, uh, you know, how would they want to buy their, their, their vegetables? You know, if they don't want to go to a farmer's market, what other options would be suitable? What pricing would be suitable? What she was doing right there is, is the investigation that a PM can do. If I was an aspiring PM, I would have jumped on that. Um, to take on that project. She, she isn't, doesn't have that business background either. Uh, and she's just trying to help her parents. She would welcome the help from one of you to offer to help and uh, guide her to build a product out of what, you know, what they have and sell it and launch it. Um, there are so many examples of this. If you don't come across these things um, naturally, post uh, use your contacts, use your, your networks, post on Facebook, uh, post on, you know, if, if you have LinkedIn contacts that you built, ask if anyone needs help trying to build a business, trying to launch a product. Uh, if anyone needs help with, you know, market analysis, competitive analysis, if anyone wants, you know, help figuring out how to price products, there are a lot of small businesses out there that are, you know, they're learning about how to do all of these things. You can learn with them, join the team, volunteer your time and help out. Um, that's, that's an, and, and, and in return, you can put all of these skills on your resume and you can talk about it when you talk to recruiters and when you talk to uh, hiring managers. The next part of this, this uh, I'm going to give you a few tips about interviewing. Uh, the Many of you have already seen or are aware of what the PM interview process is like. Uh, essentially, you have recruiter screenings. Some companies do a take home assignment either before the hiring manager screening or sometimes before the on, on site interviews. Uh, not all of them do take home assignments. Um, but um, after a hiring manager, uh, phone interview or so you have several phone interviews with other PMs and then you have on-site interviews with cross-functional teams. Uh, all of the teams that the product organization will work with. So the engineering uh, function you might uh, work, uh, have an interview with the solutions engineer, uh, engineering team or the sales teams as, as well as any UX designers if you know you work on user interfaces. So that's pretty much what the interview process is like. In terms of how you can build, um, you know, how, how you can improve on 
your interviewing skills, um, the first thing you can do is to practice your pitch. I mentioned this uh, earlier as well about practicing pitching your product. In this case, you want to, you are the product. So you want to practice explaining all of your experiences and your skill set and make it relevant to the position and the product role and try to do it in under a minute. This is the first thing you will do when you talk to any hiring manager, any recruiter, and you want to, it, it's not easy to get it right on in the first time, maybe not even the 10th time. So you want to practice, practice with whoever will um, bear with you. Uh, one thing I've also done beyond this, but this might be harder to do for aspiring PMs, is sometimes I will apply to jobs uh, that I don't want, uh, simply to practice my interviewing skills and, and, and see how that goes. So you can also do that, maybe not for product jobs, apply to, um, you know, within your fields and just practice pitching yourself and pitching your skills. This is a very good um, thing to do. The other thing that you'll be asked about is to showcase some PM skills. And we all use these skills in some way, shape or form. I, I talked about what some of those skills are that you can build, but just building those skills is not enough. You have to be able to represent them well in interviews. One methodology to do that is called the STAR method. Uh, you can uh, read up more about this. It's, it's, um, what it does is whenever you're asked a question, like how do you resolve conflict, for example, start by describing a situation or a scenario and explain your role in that scenario. From there, talk about what action you took and what the result was at the end and how you helped drive that result. That's how you would describe any of these skills questions that are asked. Uh, be very systematic and methodical about it. All of your responses should be tailored towards the PM life cycle if you're applying for a PM job. That I, and, and that's why I shared the PM life cycle before. Use uh, those phases to explain how you've worked in those different areas or what your experience is in those different areas. Because I can tell you that hiring managers, uh, even other product managers are going to want to know. They're going to ask you this at some point. So practice explaining all of your skills and experiences and orient them towards the PM life cycle. Last, uh, I want you to also apply success metrics. We as PMs, one thing we do, like I said, once we launch the product, we uh, constantly have to measure how the product is doing. You need to do this to your, you know, for yourself as well when you're interviewing. I mentioned the different steps of the interview process. Take yourself through those different steps and find out where you're having success and where you're not. So for instance, if you're not getting any recruiter callbacks, take a look at your resume and your LinkedIn profile and find out whether you have tailored your resume for that specific job. I do a separate resume for each job to make sure I hit all the uh, keywords, the main keywords that they're asking for. You want to hit those on your resume as well as you, you know, keep them on your LinkedIn profile in a meaningful way. Um, that could be the reason sometimes you do everything right and you still don't get a uh, recruiter callbacks. In that case, you have to seriously consider using your network, ask people to refer you um, and, and at least get to the recruiter phase so that you can talk to a recruiter. If you're getting past the recruiter phase, uh, but not, or you're getting to a recruiter and you're not getting past that to talk to a hiring manager, analyze how you're expressing your skills and your experience. The recruiters just have a checklist of things that they've been given um, where they have to make sure that you have, you know, you, you show certain skills. You're probably not representing yourself correctly um, to match those skills. So course correct. Constantly self -refle reflect, introspect and figure out how you can improve um, using those success metrics. And lastly, you could be doing everything right, but um, you know, it is, I, I won't lie, it's a very, very hard process 
and it's a draining process and it takes time so just be patient it, 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 you just need time sometimes um i did an informal poll of uh, some of the other pms um asking uh, you know at a high level how long it took and, and some of even some of our uh, you know seasoned pms have had to apply have had to put in like 40 applications to get in um an offer so it is going to be a long drawn out process and it's not easy but just be patient understand that this is you know, it's going to take time and prepare yourself for that and, and you'll get there. I'm confident of it. With that, I'm going to stop presenting now and I open, open it up for questions. Um, so please feel free to ask. Thank you, Cynthia. I thought that was a great talk and I really love how you have tied it to some of the pre-curated questions that the folks have submitted on the sign up form. I have throughout the talk, muted everyone. So feel free to unmute yourself and <laughs> so that you can ask questions. Uh, hi, Sandhya. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful presentation. It was really informative and motivating. Uh, I want to ask, see, I'm basically a functional consultant. I'm into SAP. So it's been five years uh, into this role now. What do you think is the right time to transition to product management? Will people think I'm too early if I just make a transition now or try to pitch in now? Or should I wait for some more time? Is there a right time you should aim at for this? I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't go about this in terms of a time frame. I would go about this in terms of the skill set that you've gathered. If you, if you have, uh, as I've expressed the different things that people are looking for in PM, if you feel that you are able to talk to some of those things, you have a very good shot at, at starting now. There, there isn't uh, an ideal time. So if, if I was evaluating somebody and they demonstrated all of the qualities I needed, I wouldn't hesitate to go forward with them just because they had one year of experience or three years of experience. So try to focus more on building the skill set rather than worry about the time. And I, I know it's still going to be hard either way, but just just keep at it and you'll get there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, uh, I'm Srinidhi. I am an early career PM in a startup. I have two questions. Uh, one is regarding prioritization. So uh, in this role, I have to take care of both the customer facing features and also the internal stakeholders like marketing, sales and customer support. In that case, uh, for example, for a customer support, Second, how do I prioritize what, what has to be built? Like, should I focus on marketing or should I focus on customer support considering I already follow the right framework? Okay, hi, Srinidhi. That's a great question. And it's th this is also why, you know, there's no right answer for prioritization. It's a very tough thing that we all deal with. You have to use a lot of your product instinct um, here or, or your experience. Um, the way I go about it is, you know, what is the impact of, of one versus the other? So if, if I have a customer feature that I have to deliver and I have X amount of revenue and I have this, this other feature that's coming in that has no revenue tied to it, but that, that has a potential for other impact that, you know, that is maybe not immediately measurable. So for instance, if you don't do this customer support thing, this means that in the end, we'll have to invest in more customer support engineers just to handle this particular issue, then that's something I would prioritize um, over a, a revenue-based item. I have actually prioritized items before that on my product that had zero revenue tied to them. Uh, the, the, you, you just have to make sure that you understand and you have an explanation for why you're prioritizing what you are. Uh, if you're doing it for, uh, you know, you're doing a customer support prioritization because of the impact that has and you understand that impact and you can explain what impact that has to the business, go ahead and prioritize that. I, I've, I've done that for strategic things before and it's actually paid off where um, we had a market inflection happening Right. For a timing and synchronization feature, for example, that, that the, the market wasn't ready for currently, but I knew that, you know, by the time the product launched, um, yeah. people would want to use it. 
Uh, I didn't have a single customer asking for it, but I prioritized it. And when we actually launched the product, it was ended up being successful because people were just, you know, just starting to move towards needing that feature. And, you know, we had it ready. We had it ready to go. My product was right there. Everybody was able to sell it more easily. So as long right. as you can justify and you can explain what that impact is and why you're prioritizing it, um, go ahead and do it. Right, right. That makes sense. Uh, and the one more question I had was, um, how do you avoid scope creep? For example, I have a, maybe the customer pain point that I'm addressing. I'm aware of what I'm addressing. I've prioritized it. But when I'm designing a solution with the engineering team, like uh, we just keep on enhancing it just to avoid the technical debt, right? So in that case, how do you avoid scope creep? That's another great question. I'm, I'm, yeah, it, it, it's funny to hear you say your engineering team uh, wants to add onto it. In my case, my eng team wants me to remove things uh, from what I want to do. So it's great to hear that you have the opposite problem. Uh, I would say stay focused. Uh, if you have, so yes, they don't want to increase technical debt for that feature, but by taking that on and by building to it, they're not doing something else that needs to be done. So you, mm -hmm. as a PM, need to look at what else is getting impacted due to the scope creep here. If, if they're going to spend uh, another sprint cycle, you know, to right. enhance this product, what else aren't they doing? And if they aren't doing that, bring that to the table and say, look, we could enhance this or we could solve this other customer pain point that's going to bring in X amount of revenue. And so, right. you know, for that reason, I would say stop, you know, cap what you're doing here and move on to this other feature and we'll address other enhancements to it later. Right, right, got it. Yeah, this was very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Sandhya, I'm Pratishta. I'm also a fellow PM at uh, a cybersecurity company. I work at Palo Alto Networks. Um, also working in the SaaS product space. So very interested just to know that uh, it's, I've been into this for a year now. And one constant conundrum that I have is when you work with so much data, then where do you draw a line between being super technical and getting your hands extremely dirty with the data for building like a data product versus uh, like, yeah, where do you draw a line with how much do you get involved with data space and how much do you continue with the PM and business side of things? So, uh, hi, Pratishta, I think I got, I hope I got your name right. Yeah, no, um, that's right. Thank you for your question. You know, what I want to point out here is that the prioritization technique I just mentioned for features needs to be applied to ourselves as PMs as well. Because mm -hmm. if you spend your time, it's, it's very tempting to do technical stuff as well. Sometimes I like to jump into it just because I came from that, that area and it's, you know, it's fun to get back into doing some more of the technical stuff, but it comes at a cost. We have fixed amount of a fixed amount of time, um, and if we if we use that time to you know on the technical aspect, which we have um, dedicated folks generally for, there's there's other stuff on the product side, on the business side that you could be doing that you won't have time for, and it, 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 something else is always going to take a hit. So you have to weigh that and see whether, first off, is there someone else who can take on the technical stuff? Um, and, and you know, if so, focus more on growing that product and growing the business, because that's what makes a bigger impact overall to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And that's only on you. There's nobody else who's going to do that. Right, right. That, that makes a lot of sense. And just to, just as a quick follow-up, if it's in a product design phase, right, where there's nothing that you could do about the revenue or there's nothing that you're focusing really on, like the go-to-market or the launch yet, at that point in time, how much would you involve yourself? Just from your experience, just inquisitive to know. So if it's in the, when it's in the design phase, um, I do dive deeply into the design with the engineering teams. Because, like you said, it's a very important. It's it's very important to define the product correctly. But even in that phase, I'm not focused on how to do it. I leave the how to the engineering team. In those discussions, again, I'm wearing that customer hat, that customer persona, and I'm constantly representing what the user wants to that discussion. 
So I let the end team decide the how and paying attention and listening to it and making sure that what they are building is what the user wants. And you know, if there's input or feedback I have to go get to support directing the product being built a certain way, then mm -hmm. that's what I go and do. And I come back and, and guide the product, um, uh, the engineering build out of that product in a certain way based on what that product, uh, what the customer is telling me or what the users are telling me. But I still, you know, wear that user hat in those discussions. I don't take on the technical role um, as much. I make sure I understand what's going on, but don't don't try to do the how. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Sandhya, this is uh, Pragnya. Um, yeah, I have a question about how user feedback how do you, from time to time, how do you get feedback, user feedback? Um, so you, you were saying that while in, while you're in the design phase, also you're listening to your users. Uh, are you, how, how can you like actually get feedback when you're in the design phase? Uh, you yourself are trying to make sense of where this is going, right? Um, I mean, you have a problem definition, but time to time you, you can't really have a feedback loop at that point because it's too early stage. So how do you kind of reorient yourself time to time and get in touch with users? What is your feedback loop? That's a great question. I work for a B2B product. So for a B2B product, I have sales teams um, and I either that talk to customers and I understand customers that they're, they're talking to them constantly. But as a PM, I also want to talk to customers directly myself. So there are certain products, uh, you know, like for instance, the one I'm working on now, I understand the customer pain point, but when I'm actually building the product, I'm, I'm not ready to share with customers yet that I'm building this product, I'm building this design, but I do bring the sales teams and the field teams in that circle um, and, and make sure they understand what it is I'm building and I get feedback from them. They're also in a way, um, you know, they're my secondhand users of the product. I use them to, to, you know, as sounding boards to get some input. And if they don't have that input, then, um, you know, they know how to get that from the customer as well without giving away what we're doing. You know, we, in some cases, I actually do talk to customers directly where I mentioned that we're considering building some roadmap features or some new products. And, um, you know, in those products, if we gave, if we offered you this, would it help? Or would you want, uh, is there something else you want to, you, you'd like, you'd prefer to solve this problem? And most customers are more than willing to share that information with you because they, you know, they want to be helpful. They want to be part of the solution. Um, so you have to judge what's the right time to talk to customers and how to talk to customers is a way to explain, um, to bring in, uh, or, or ask for feedback without really giving too much, too many details because you're still in development. Um, so I use both those techniques. I talk to customers directly as well as use my field and sales folks a lot more uh, when I want to get input. All right, great. Thanks, Sandhya. Yeah. Hey, Sandhya, this is Hari. Seems like a good place to get in here. Uh, first off, uh, everything you explained is fantastic. It, I think some of the things you mentioned goes beyond product management, which is great, especially what you said about pitching your product on a daily basis to someone. I think that uh, maybe because I don't do it enough, uh, you know, the end result that you're trying to achieve, pitching it to somebody, getting feedback, I think is very critical. So that's a very good point, and I really like that. Um, I am curious, uh, just uh, kind of dovetailing on the previous question, uh, with respect to feedback on your product, um, you know, in your experience, how closely have you worked with partners and how much have you involved them, you know, in building your product and uh, how much are they part of your go to market strategy? Great question, Hari. The product that I'm currently building is a, it's a software, it's an automation product that I want to keep very you know, I, I, it's too early for me to share too much with customers on, but I still want feedback. Um, I uh, ask about trusted partners. We have trusted partners as well. So 
there are some partners that just take what you have and go sell. But then there are other partners who actually have in the past tested products, uh, tested our products before they position them um, to customers. I try to target those kind of partners for in, for information and input. They've all signed NDA. They're all in, in everybody understands these are like products in in development. So what I'm trying to do right now for my current product is bring in a couple of those trusted partners into the beta uh, to, to test my product before I actually launch it and give me feedback on how to improve. But um, I don't use partners for very, very early feedback um, because uh, there are other ways to get information about what the customer needs. And my partner is also a potential um, revenue generator for my product. So I, uh, you know, I bring them in at a stage when I know the product is, is on its way. I need, you know, the last bit of feedback and, you know, if, uh, input to, to polish it. Um, I bring them in it, it in at that time to, to uh, get their input. You know, you, you have to judge based on the relationship you have with the partners at what stage you want to bring them in. It's a, a great idea to bring them in um, before you launch for sure. But, uh, you know, how early you bring them in will determine on the, will, will really de uh, be determined based on the relationship you have with them, how friendly they are and how involved and invested they are in, in your product, in your uh, company. Awesome. That's great feedback. Thank you, Sandhya. Sure. And I'm great to see you here again. Thanks. Yeah, I can't see you yet, but yeah. <laughs> we should catch up after. Hari and I used to work at Sprint together. That's, uh, and, and Jennifer for some time too, but we didn't cross paths too often. Yeah, when you were going through the sprint story, I was like, yes, I know that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sent you another question, Sandhya. Uh, could you just uh, brief me about what would be the kind of questions, opinion, interview questions that would be asked for a person who's, who's stuck getting into the PM world for the first time? So I think the PM questions uh, essentially um, will still center around the skill set because you'll still be doing the you know pm tasks they'll just be more forgiving of the actual experience around it so even if you don't have a, a product that you've taken all the way to launch you can still expect to be asked about you know how would you prioritize uh in in, a, in this scenario or how would you um uh, work cross-functionally with different teams? Uh, how would you go about defining product requirements? How would you do uh, your market analysis? How would you build a business case? You need to still know how to do all these things um, because they want to know how you think um, and what approach you use uh, in, this, in the process. One question that I think you get, whether you're a uh, uh, aspiring PM or, or and, I, and I've seen this question come up a lot too in interviews is how do you use data to drive your decisions? How do you make decisions uh, in whatever you do? Um, and you know you want to be able to demonstrate how you use data to drive your decision. That's very important in the PM role. So uh, even even though you don't uh, you know you won't be able to demonstrate direct experience taking a product um, to launch, you will still be able to answer, you, or you should still be able to start building your skill set around all of these questions because this is what they're looking for in the end. So you will be asked this in some version, shape or form. Right, thank you. That was helpful, thanks. Yeah, and just jumping in real quick, I know there's a lot of great um, communities out there that people may have heard of. So I know Louis Lee Lin, he has a Facebook group that's all around mock interview practice, PM interview practice. There's another company I believe called Stella Peers that's also a, again, volunteer kind of peer matched 
mock interviews. So definitely there's a lot of great resources out there, whether that be books, right? Cracking the product manager interview to actual communities where you can pair up with someone else to practice. Great point. Thank you. Of course. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Sonia. So I have a question like you were saying Sandhya, that you came from that technical background. So, um, so what did you take away uh, when somebody wants to transition from software engineering background to, or software or, or a QA engineering background to product manager? I mean, uh, so the kind of struggle uh, I'm facing right now is like how to convince people that, you know, I can do the product or I can work as a product manager. I mean, the kind of right stories to work on to, 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 to convince people. So I would say try to take on projects or take on tasks that can demonstrate how you can be a product manager and not just talk about it. So an example I gave is um, for if, if you're a software developer and you've been asked to, to build a feature, go into competitive analysis to find out what your competition is doing about that feature. How are they building it? Um, what are, how are users going to use it? and document that um, because then you can reference that in your experience that you know you've done competitive analysis you have you have, you've worn that pm hat um, the other way you can do it is uh, like i said approach your pm team and offer to help uh, it, it, there isn't there isn't anybody out there and and be sincere about it so if you offer to help and you take on a task do it well it, it's a lot of extra work but focus on it, do it well, and make a good impression. Um, I can guarantee you when the time comes that you know they're thinking about bringing on a new PM and you've made that impression on them, you won't have to talk about what you did. You know, They will kind of talk about it for you. I'm actually doing, I'm seeing this happen right now um, in my role where I have uh, you know, folks approach me who are interested in product management and I see that they're sincere and they're taking on certain PM tasks and uh, I advocate for them um, you know when I see that there is there's an opportunity for a role you know I bring them up this person has shown you know great interest has helped has done some PM tasks why don't we consider them so take try to do some of those things uh, it will help you break in in your current org Okay, so that is helpful. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everyone for a riveting session. And <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. I know you filled it literally half an hour of questions. So hopefully that um, felt very much like an AMA where you got a chance to ask Cynthia firsthand with all the questions you have in mind. And thank you all again for taking the time out of your Friday evenings, wherever you are in the world. And again, thank you, Cynthia. Do you have any parting message you would like to share? I just wanted to thank you so much, Lisa, for all the effort and the time you put in. This is so great and will help so many aspiring PMs. Um, and thank you all for attending. I really enjoyed my time uh, here with you all. And I wanted to wish you all the very best to, towards building your own product journeys. So I hope to see you all at VM soon. <laughs>